We're going to start in about 30 seconds. Would you please take your seats? Thank you. Well, let me uh, begin the next set of tracks. I'm very happy and pleased that uh, Ambassador Kirsty Kalpi has uh, spent some time with us this morning and has been so receptive to spending time with us this morning to give the second of four keynotes throughout the day. As many of you know, Ambassador Kalpi is Finland's ambassador to the United States, has been a longtime friend of the Arctic, was instrumental in supporting the uh, Fulbright Arctic Initiative, which was a concurrent effort of the U.S. chairmanship. And now with Finland taking over the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, it's particularly important to hear from Finland. And who better to speak to us than Ambassador Kalpi? Would you please welcome her to the podium? Thank you very much uh, for this possibility to speak here. And I have to say it's been an extremely interesting morning. Uh, the discussion has been very rich and I have learned a lot. Um, the Arctic issues are close to my heart for two reasons. I think I can almost claim to be a product of the Arctic. I was born and raised uh, very close to the Arctic Circle. The second reason is uh, that I do think that what happens in the Arctic is absolutely vitally important for the whole world. Um, and when going through quite a lot of material when preparing for this uh, conference, um, I came across something that my president said in uh, Arhangelsk. Uh, in the uh, conference organized in March on the Arctic territory of dialogue. And he said, um, if we lose the Arctic, we lose the whole globe. So just to reiterate some of the facts, impact of climate change in the Arctic is more than double elsewhere. The resulting changes in the Arctic amplify global impact of climate change. Increasing scope and interest in economic activity in the Arctic means that there's a growing need to ensure that this economic activity happens in a sustainable manner. And finally, the interests of the Arctic peoples have to be safeguarded in, this, in these developments. So I think it is absolutely clear that international cooperation is vital because nobody can achieve all these things alone. So that is my first point. Secondly, uh, there are a lot of uh, international fora for cooperation and that is extremely good. There are bilateral cooperation arrangements for governments, for businesses, for civil societies. There are international organizations, maybe just to mention the International Maritime Organization, WMO, IMO, WMO, um, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, so this is very good. We need a network of uh, fora for international cooperation. Uh, we do believe that the most important international forum for Arctic issues is the Arctic Council. And the Arctic Council, obviously, everybody knows the structure of the Arctic Council, but what makes the Arctic Council really unique are two things, in our opinion. The first is that there is the active involvement of indigenous peoples. Uh, and secondly, that the work of the Arctic Council is very, um, the, there's a very deep-rooted connection with the scientific community. And these two things make the Arctic Council uh, unique as a forum for international cooperation in the Arctic. Now, um, the purpose of the Arctic Council is to increase cooperation coordination and interaction. And the focus is very much on three things, protecting <clears throat> environment, promoting sustainable development, and improving the well-being of Arctic residents. And all of these three things are linked together. Uh, as I said, the scientific aspect of the work of the uh, Arctic Council is very important because basically most of the reports, the advice and the recommendations given are based on scientific um, um, reports. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are recommendations, there is advice, there is uh, joint scientific research, and then there are the three international agreements that have been negotiated under the auspices of the Arctic Council. All of them are extremely important. The latest one uh, regarding scientific cooperation. Um, and um, what is also important to understand that uh, even if I just emphasize the, the importance of the Arctic Council, uh, the implementation of the recommendations and advice and the agreements is a national responsibility. So the Arctic Council is not an, uh, a supra-national uh, organization. Um, there are other uh, fora for cooperation, as I mentioned earlier, and I would just like to maybe, uh, because I hope that it will be discussed in the panel, point out on, on two where Finland has been very active. Uh, the other one is uh, Barents Euro Arctic Cooperation uh, uh, Council, and the other is Northern Dimension, which is the policy uh, jointly together between the EU, Iceland, Norway, and Russia where very concrete things have been um, implemented to improve the, um, the environment, but also other aspects of, uh, in this case, not necessarily all of it in the Arctic, but close to the Arctic. So my second point was uh, that the Arctic Council is the most consequential international forum for Arctic issues with its unique characteristics related to the role of indigenous peoples and science. My third uh, observation regards uh, the broader context where we are. It has been mentioned here, uh, I think it was uh, President um, Crimson who mentioned uh, the Cold War and the fact that this cooperation in the Arctic Council, but all the other uh, cooperation for us, well, couldn't exist if, uh, if it was not a post-Cold War era. So in a sense, the cooperation in the Arctic is a peace dividend after the Cold War, and that is important. Um, while the reasons for the international tensions that are real and uh, the reasons are also real, and those tensions cannot be ignored. Uh, it is, uh, we are very convinced that it 
must be possible to continue the cooperation in the Arctic and that it is in the interest of everybody to continue the cooperation. Um, it is good to note that the international tensions have not affected uh, the work in the Arctic Council, and we certainly hope that that remains so. In this context, it is uh, good to note that military security has been explicitly excluded from the Arctic Council. It is also in this broader context good to note when we are talking about tensions that actually in one respect the Arctic could be a region for tensions but is not and that is territorial claims because it was also mentioned here all the uh, riparian states of the Arctic Sea have agreed to follow the principles of the UN Convention on Law of the Seas when uh, addressing the territorial disputes. So the, the conclusion here is that while the reasons for the international tensions are real and cannot be ignored, it is totally possible and it is absolutely in the interest of everybody to continue to cooperate fully as far, to, far as the Arctic issues are concerned. There's another uh, uh, question related to this broader context. I was talking about security, international tensions. The other obvious one is that um, as far as climate change is concerned, uh, we cannot save the Arctic without addressing the climate issues globally. And there we obviously come to the issue of the Paris Climate Agreement which in our opinion, the Finnish opinion, is uh, a vital agreement in order to um, address the climate change. And obviously we were disappointed the US decided to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, but we are hopeful that the concrete cooperation and the concrete actions to mitigate climate change and to adapt globally uh, can continue. Um, and finally, on the Finnish chairmanship of the Arctic Council. Um, first of all, I want to very, very sincerely thank the US team. US preceded us in the chairmanship and uh, did an excellent job. And we also cooperated very closely uh, to when drawing up our own chairmanship plan and also making sure that the continuity uh, is there. So we do believe that the continuity in the work of the Arctic Council is vitally important. And uh, in that sense, um, we are also looking at the possibility to look at longer term uh, common objectives and perspectives in the Arctic Council. Let us see how, how that process uh, could succeed, but um, continuity is extremely important and, and sort of flexible and, and, um, and innovative ways to, to ensure that continuity would be very important. Um, the Finnish chairmanship got a very good start in Fairbanks. We could agree on a, on a very substantive Fairbanks uh, declaration. There was already the uncertainty about the US uh, attitude towards the Paris Agreement there, but that was not an obstacle as far as agreeing on a substantive declaration was concerned. And that is why I'm also hopeful as far as the future concrete work of the Arctic Council is concerned. I think we can take a pragmatic attitude and, uh, and the Fairbanks Declaration uh, is one of the um, um, clear indicators that that can be the case. Now, uh, in, in the work of the Arctic Council, we, Finland as a chair, um, is of the opinion that the climate change and sustainable development 
have to be taken into consideration in everything that we do. The inclusive cooperation is extremely important. The uh, role of the indigenous peoples, peoples uh, living in the Arctic, are uh, of real value and value in itself. The theme of the uh, Finnish uh, chairmanship program is exploring common solutions to common problems. And with that theme, we want to emphasize uh, the pragmatic problem-solving orientation of our joint work. Problem-solving orientation based on sound scientific analysis and uh, thorough discussions. Um, the work of the Arctic Council will continue uh, in full form uh, it's very extensive. I have to say that I was totally exhausted after reading the reports because it seems that there's so much going on. I can't keep any track of all the different working groups, expert groups, reports, things like that. All of them extremely important. So uh, proceeding uh, uh, with, uh, with all of those. But we did identify four priority areas where we would like to maybe concentrate some more effort. The first is environmental protection, and um, there the special emphasis that we would like to put in is biodiversity, safeguarding biodiversity, uh, mitigating and addressing the issue of ocean acidification, and then a huge, huge uh, issue uh, uh, fighting um, or looking for solutions regarding black carbon and methane. And lastly, the litter that is also threatening the Arctic Ocean. So the first priority is the environmental protection. The second uh, priority is connectivity. And this is basically continuing the work uh, started by the US uh, when establishing the telecommunications working group, but also um, maybe extending the, the work of that uh, group to connectivity in broader terms. And here uh, we are very much hoping to cooperate together with the Arctic Economic Council, uh, in other words, the private sector, the businesses. The third uh, priority area is meteorological cooperation, which uh, obviously is extremely important for, for, for climate reasons, but also uh, the, the uh, economic activities and for people living in the Arctic. And here the focus is more looking at the different networks that exist and making sure that they could cooperate more closely together with each other in order to uh, improve on the data coverage and data availability. And there we hope that a closer cooperation with the World Meteorological Organization would be possible. And, and that is something that we want to promote. The fourth and final area of priority is education. And uh, this is an extremely important area because uh, it's related to how the perspectives of the people living in, in the Arctic um, uh, look like and their opportunities and, and uh, also the question of adaptation to the changing environment. Um, there, we hope that there will be uh, maybe more collaboration with the University of the Arctic uh, and the teacher training uh, networks, uh, but many other things as well. And uh, maybe mm, two more points. Um, I think um, somebody mentioned uh, earlier on that we have, or especially our president, uh, Niinistö has floated this idea that if the circumstances allow, maybe um, there would be 
a possibility to organize a summit of the Arctic Council during our chairmanship. Uh, it is not uh, an, uh, an objective in itself. Uh, it is if the circumstances allow and if there is uh, enough of agenda for that. But we do feel that, that this is an area where, where uh, first of all, the Arctic agenda would benefit from uh, attention from the highest levels and the good cooperation and the vitally important cooperation that we are doing in the Arctic could actually contribute to, to the overall international situation. Uh, but let's see. Maybe my final uh, observation is that I am also hopeful. I'm, uh, I'm quite hopeful about the Arctic Council especially and the Arctic cooperation in the different international fora. But I'm also, um, I also feel that we would need still more a sense of urgency. Uh, we cannot solve the Arctic issues only in the Arctic. We need strong international uh, political will, concrete cooperation, concrete and pragmatic solutions, including innovations to address the bigger issue of climate change. And there, the urgency is really real. And finally, I would like to thank very much for this opportunity to, to speak here and looking forward to learning more also from this uh, next panel and the panels thereafter. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador Kalpi. I can think of no better way to uh, set the context uh, and the foundation for the next panel. So thank you very much for those thoughts, but for also setting the tone and tenor for the next discussion. And this discussion is entitled A Record of Cooperation in the Arctic, so the themes fit very well. This panel is being moderated by my colleague, Matt Rajansky, who is now in the middle. It's okay, I think everyone will sit where you would like, and then I will introduce you as best as possible from left to right. Excellent. So on my immediate left, on my immediate right, is the Honorable Don Young, Congressman for the State of Alaska. Appropriately that Alaska introduces his representative in such a grand stature in a grand way. Welcome, Congressman. To his immediate left is Ambassador David Bolton, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Oceans and Fisheries, Department of State. To David's left, ah, thank you, Katri Kolmeni, who is a member of parliament from Finland and a member of the Standing Committee of the Parliamentarians of the Arctic Region. To her left is Elena Kudrashova, she is the rector of the Northern Arctic Federal University and a leader in the University of the Arctic. I believe I introduced Matt Rajansky, who is the director of the Kennan Institute. I'm going to step away from the microphone so I can look to see who is to the left. And from Russia. I think we're getting the Semarite right now. Mr. George A. Karloff, who's a deputy chairman, of the State Duma of the Russian Federation. So would you please welcome them now that they are all seated. I have properly introduced them. And Matt, I will turn the panel over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Uh, it's really, um, for, for someone like myself who, who studies uh, Russia and U.S.-Russian relations and um, uh, has spent the last, I want to say six months, but it's been a lot longer than that, I guess, just reading bad news item after bad news item. It is nice to hear people talk about the potential uh, for cooperation. And uh, one of the things I like about this particular panel is that uh, it actually cites a history of cooperation, a record of cooperation. So I would invite uh, the panelists to think in terms of both where we're coming from as well as where we're going um, and, and provide a very uh, unique 
uh, maybe slightly more positive moment uh, in, in what has certainly been a, a challenging overall context. And I think it's, it's very timely and important that we have two distinguished uh, Russian participants on our panel, uh, as well as, of course, uh, two representatives from Washington and Katri joining us from Finland. So um, we're going to slightly change the uh, order on the, um, on the program just because of uh, time constraints and changing time. So what I'll do is uh, go first to Mr. Young. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists, if you can, to keep it relatively compact so we can stay to a 45 or 50 minute panel, please. I uh, hope this is on. Is it on? So the light doesn't, you know, congressmen are funny. If the light doesn't show up, they really don't know what they're doing. Uh, first, thank you for this uh, forum. I want to thank the Wilson Center. I'm in awe. I, it's the first time I've been here. Uh, it's huge. Uh, believe me, if you're parked in the garage, it's huger. Bad English. Uh, I'm very excited about the forum and about the Arctic. Me, Treadwell, mentioned one of the things he, when he was going to Yale, uh, he came back because he visited Alaska, working with the governor at that time, and decided to get his degree in the law of the sea, the Arctic, and the future, the vision of the Arctic. And I compliment him on that. I have some of my good friends from Beryl Inuits here. Um, I deeply appreciate your being here. Uh, I, I am the only congressman that lives above the Arctic Circle. I'm quite proud of that. Uh, my area is as cold as it can get in the, in the world, probably, 79 below zero one time. That's what you call finger-dropping cold. Um, this is an exciting time, and I, I'd like to suggest that um, uh, even during the Cold War, um, Alaska, my Alaskan um, Aboriginal people and Russia got along well. We got along well. There was a feeling of working together in a harsh climate. Uh, that still exists today. And I agree with the moderator. Uh, the news we have is not good. It's really promoted by the national media. Uh, and in Russia is looked upon by the national media and why I don't know is our enemy. Maybe it's because it comes out of Moscow and it comes out of Washington, D.C. Maybe it's not knowledgeable about the Arctic. The Arctic is the future of the globe. It's where 31 known minerals we have today exist and have been locked up all this time. It's where most of the fossil fuels exist, is in the Arctic. It is where the transportation corridor exists and will exist in a better style later on. It is the future. <clears throat> now, I sometimes have strange dreams, but I actually dreamt of creating a new nation. I told you this would be a little off the wall. A new nation of Alaska seceding from the Union, because we're the Arctic nation. <laughs> Siberia and, I would say, uh, Chukotka succeeding from Moscow joining Finland, Canada, Norway, and all the other countries making an Arctic nation. Because it is where the future lies in this globe of ours. My biggest challenge as a congressman is you tell that to somebody in Nebraska, Iowa, or Nevada, and they say, what? And it's going to take a lot of education, a lot of I call saying that is what is the future, the Arctic. And I'm still excited about it. And I am hoping that um, we can get the world excited about it. And we work cooperatively together. And if that's my cell phone, I'm going to find myself $10. And I apologize for that. I don't know why somebody's calling me when I'm in this forum. They know where I am. And else it's the president. If I was the president, I might talk to him. We won't talk about the Paris Treaty or anything else. We'll talk about something else. But I compliment all of you on your interest, because this is where the action is going. Now, I will be a little bit critical. The previous speaker talked about the council. It's good. It does good work. But I'm a little tired of people not doing something. I want action. That's my background. I want to get things done. 
I don't do it, just talk about it. It is time for the Arctic nations to set our forum together and decide what we have to do and do it. If it's transportation, navigation, icebreakers, taxes on ships that pass across the Northwest, then let's do it. I think that's an important thing to do because we can have all these meetings and if we don't do something, follow them, we haven't done our job and the Arctic is too important. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Young. I, I wonder, your proposal to uh, secede from the United States uh, and then join with regions of uh, several other countries might need to be investigated by your colleagues on the Hill. I think, uh, uh, I think they have a procedure for that now. I, I, I will tell you, truthfully, I've been investigated for a long time. They still haven't found anything. <laughs> Um, so speaking of getting uh, as far away from uh, Washington and Moscow as possible, uh, we have Mr. Karloff joining us from Sakhalin. So please. Yes. Здравствуйте и разрешите мне несколько слов сказать более в практической плоскости в заявленной секции. Uh, good morning. Uh, allow me to say a few words uh, in a pr practical scale, uh, so to speak, on the, on the subject declared. В первую очередь, конечно, я хочу благодарить господина Гримсона за возможность его его усилиями вот создать возможность такую приятного общения, обмена мнениями и чувством юмора в том числе. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Mr. Grimson uh, for his effort in setting up such an exchange, uh, such a pleasant exchange, including some humorous remarks. Тем не менее, международное сотрудничество, считаю, в нашем направлении жиждется прежде всего на нашей истории. I think international cooperation uh, rests above all on our histories. И нашей истории 1 августа этого года исполнится ровно 135 лет с момента проведения международных экспедиций в Арктике и Антарктике. До 2009 года существовало понятие «международный полярный год», И четыре вот этих вот международных полярных года ознаменовывались различного рода международным научным исследовательскими изысканиями всех стран, разных специалистов, ученых, которые приносили всему миру новые сведения о об Арктике и об Антарктике. Up to 2009 uh, there was a notion of the International Polar Year, and we had four years filled with all kinds of meetings and research of uh, very important personalities in science and technology that exchanged views and helped us resolve problems in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Russia in 2009 proposed to increase the time from the year to the year and the international polar year is already working и приносит свои плоды международного сотрудничества. Я считаю, что продолжение и консолидация усилий в научно-исследовательских направлениях по Арктике Это один из важнейших фундаментов для консолидации наших научно-исследовательских сил, финансовых усилий, исследовательских и научного потенциала стран. I think that continuing the Arctic research in every possible way is the surest way of consolidating our potential uh, both in science, uh, finance and in every other possible way. Многие сравнивают Арктику, изучение Арктики как с изучением космоса. Я думаю, что это действительно настолько же является глобальной проблемой и с точки зрения временных отрезков и финансирования научно-исследовательских работ. Uh, 
uh, to researching space, and I think uh, there's a similarity there. The problem is global uh, in terms of how much time it takes and how much money uh, is going to be required. Понимая развитие природно-климатических и в том числе глобального потепления и как это будет влиять в дальнейшем на развитие арктического региона и на планету в целом, мы можем строить дальнейшие планы. Uh, with, a, with a good understanding of what's going on with our climate and the global impact of the warming, uh, and uh, both uh, in the Arctic and uh, globally uh, on our entire planet, we can start making plans for the future. И будущее в этом случае в Арктическом регионе мы можем uh, с уверенностью говорить будет связано с установлением нормальной теле телекоммуникационных связей и транспорта. And of course, the future here is going to be linked uh, to establishing good telecommunication systems and transportation. Невозможно представить себе глобальную транспортную составляющую или развитие социально-экономического и экономического развития этого региона без устойчивой связи, которая поможет нам решить все остальные вопросы. You can't imagine a, a reliable future uh, for transportation or the socio-economic development of that region without the telecommunications component. И uh, в этом направлении Российская Федерация достаточно много делает. Все страны Арктического региона, каждый по-своему делает достаточно большие усилия. Но, тем не менее, нам необходима четко скоординированная программа совместных деятель... совместной деятельности по установлению бесперебойной связи в Арктическом регионе. Uh, the Russian Federation has been doing a lot in that area, and uh, so, has, uh, so have uh, the other countries of the Arctic region. Uh, they've been making an effort there, but we still need a coordinated program uh, that could ensure that we do have uninterrupted communications in that area. Транспортная составляющая, как одна из важнейших экономических составляющих по передвижению обмена товарами из Азии в Европу, из Америки в Азию. Безусловно, это тот путь, куда э, рано или поздно мы все э, придем, и э, обеспечение соответствующей инфраструктурой транспортной, э, обеспечением соответствующего количества транспортных средств, кораблей, ледоколов и средств э, спасения – это задача, которую нужно решать уже сегодня и только в координации со всеми. And of course, uh, another extremely important component is transportation, and, and uh, we, we, transportation, and uh, we're going to get there, we're going to create it, but what we need there is infrastructure for the transportation, and I mean icebreakers, ships, uh, equipment to rescue, and, and that is, uh, can only be possible in coordination and cooperation with other countries. Именно после этого мы сможем перейти к полноценному освоению арктических э, природных э, запасов, в том числе водно-биологических ресурсов, э, энергетических ресурсов и э, прочих экономических э, выгод э, по развитию Арктики. Uh, it's only after establishing that infrastructure that we can go on uh, to using uh, to our benefit the natural resources, and that includes water, uh, biological resources, energy, uh, that could yield great results uh, for everyone. Ни одна из этих трех задач невозможно будет к решению одной из стран Арктического региона. Только в кооперации все вместе мы сможем достаточно понятный определенный период времени в разумные э, ресурсные возможности э, с, э, и использованием потенциала научного в том числе и предпринимательского потенциала наших стран э, мы сможем эффективно в обозримом, в обозримом абсолютно будущем э, войти в Арктику как э, не чужие люди. Uh, none of those three tasks can be done single-handedly by just one country. That can be achieved only in cooperation and collaboration uh, between and among uh, uh, various countries. And in that, in that um, uh, case, uh, we could establish a clear time frame for those efforts, reasonable resources that are going to be required, uh, involving uh, the scientific potential and the potential of the private sector. And we should be talking, in that case, if we manage to do all of that, we could be talking about developing the Arctic in a foreseeable future. В заключение я хочу привести цитату моего друга, коллеги Челенгарова Артура Николаевича, 
И, кстати, вручить письмо мистеру Гримсону от него. In closing, I would like to quote uh, my friend, my colleague uh, in, in the parliament, Russian parliament, Artur Chilingarov, and uh, actually pass on a letter from Mr. Chilingarov uh, to Mr. Grimson. Сотрудничество в Арктике – это образец добрососедской, стабильной и предсказуемой политики. Мы должны сделать все, что для нас возможное, чтобы распространить дух дружбы и сотрудничества как свойственно полярникам в целом, во все э, возможные другие наши стороны сотрудничества. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Karlov. And now I come to Ambassador Balton. Uh, thanks very much. Good morning. I'd like to start by thanking Mike Sraga and other friends from the Wilson Center for inviting me. I'd also, also like to thank President Grimson and Alice Rogoff uh, and commend you for your ongoing leadership of the Arctic Circle and the way you've partnered with the Wilson Center to create this event. And finally, I want to thank um, the government of Finland, Ambassador Kaupi. It's <laughs> such a comfort to me to know that the Arctic Council is in such good hands now that the U.S. chairmanship has drawn to an end. So I began my career at the Department of State in 1985. The Cold War was still underway, although it ended a few years after that. And just more or less as it was ending, I began, perhaps coincidentally, uh, to start working uh, with the Russian Federation on a variety of things over the years. And I've had a an interesting window on the U.S.-Russian relationship all the years since. Um, and I can honestly say that in, in my time, I have uh, not experienced a moment when the relationship has been filled with as many difficulties as it is at present. And that's saying something. I'd also say it's also uh, one of the more peculiar times in the relationship in any number of ways. And yet, as other speakers have pointed out, and I too point out, it seems as though the Arctic is an exception. The United States and Russia, I would say Russia and all the other nations in the Arctic have found ways to continue to cooperate in the Arctic, particularly but not only through the Arctic Council, despite the difficulties on other issues and relating to other parts of the world. Um, and so I'd like to highlight a few uh, examples of that cooperation, but then ask perhaps a more important question, why? Why has it been possible to continue to cooperate in the Arctic uh, in these times? So my last uh, 10 years or so, I focused quite a lot on the Arctic Council. Senator Murkowski mentioned that the recent agreement signed in Fairbanks on scientific cooperation was produced uh, through a process co-chaired by the U.S. and Russia, and that is, that is true. Uh, she didn't mention, but is also true that the first two binding agreements to come through the Arctic Council process, one on search and rescue and one on oil pollution preparedness and response, were also co-chaired by the United States and Russia in the case of the oil pollution agreement also by Norway. But it does demonstrate that uh, our two countries, the United States and Russia, have been leading on at least these types of issues. And more broadly, through the last two years of the U.S. chairmanship, I can tell you firsthand that uh, the success of the U.S. chairmanship, and I do think it was successful, uh, could not have been achieved without the active um, and willing cooperation from Russia and, of course, all other members. It's not that everybody agreed on everything at the outset, but there was an authentic and sincere desire to work hard to find common ground and to resolve differences. Outside the Arctic Council as well, I've been working uh, with colleagues from Russia on issues relating to the Bering Sea and polar bears, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, Russia and some other countries uh, signed in 2015 uh, 
declaration relating to Arctic fisheries, and we are, at the moment, still in negotiation toward a possible agreement on Arctic fisheries. Again, signs of strong cooperation. Why? Why is this possible today when so many other things seem so difficult? And I think it is mostly that we have common interests in the Arctic, and first and foremost, we want the Arctic to remain a stable, peaceful, rule-based part of the world. It is that today. When you think of other parts of the world that are subject to armed conflict, terrorism, forced migration, narco-trafficking or other trafficking humans, hardly any of that occurs in the Arctic today, and frankly, I think it's a low-threat region for those sorts of things. It's not that the Ar Arctic is without its challenges, it is, but those challenges are primarily socioeconomic and environmental. And the nations of the Ar and the peoples of the Arctic need a stable, peaceful, rules-based environment in which to try to address these things. And we need each other. We need to share each other's science and best practices. On search and rescue, it's been mentioned, we need each other. If uh, problems, as almost certainly will happen, uh, incidents occur in the Arctic, we need to cooperate to address them. Oil pollution and other pollution, again, no one nation can work on this successfully alone. Yes, we need each other. There was a question this morning about whether there's any serious sovereignty in dispute in the Arctic. The answer is no. The national boundaries are all well established. Yeah, there's one small island that both Canada and Denmark claim, but I'd say that's very well managed and not really a dispute at all. <laughs> there are um, a few maritime boundaries, including between the US and Canada, that are not resolved, but I wouldn't call that a dispute as such. It is a uh, something we're still working on. There are uh, efforts to delineate the outer limits of the continental shelves in the Arctic, but that is too proceeding under the rules set by the Law of the Sea Convention in a peaceful and orderly way. And so we need each other to keep the Arctic um, stable in order to address the real problems there, and I think that helps to account for why we are able to continue to cooperate despite difficulties elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Baldwin. Um, I'll go now to Professor Kudrashva. Thank you very much, dear hosts, dear organizers and colleagues. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at the session and discuss cooperation perspectives in the light of the U.S.-Russian relationship in the Arctic. Well, I'm representative here of the Northern Arctic Federal University, the biggest higher educational institutions in the Arctic zone of Russian Federation. The city of Akangelsk, where the university is located, was founded in the 16th century as the first Russian trade seaport and has been always famous by its international connections. A few impulse uh, to uh, international cooperation, a new impulse to the international cooperation was done in the 90s, where the Barents Euro Arctic region was established and the institutions and people in the region started to, to cooperate across the borders. The Russian national policy in Arctic research and education takes its point of departure in a number of state documents. And the main one, the basic principles of state policy in the Arctic. The main fields of the Russian Arctic zone development have been taken by many universities as a part of their uh, in institutional strategy to respond to major challenges in connection with the Arctic uh, investigation. The number of programs with the Arctic content and the number of uh, enrolled students is increasing in Russian academia now. The universities in Russia respond to their needs to train high-skilled specialists for such areas as 
constructing and petroleum engineering, mining, environmental and resource management, transport infrastructure, shipbuilding and marine technologies. The Northern Arctic Federal University, as an Arctic university in Russia, defined it its mission to create a system of continuous education through the integration of business, science, and industry to reflect needs of the Russian Arctic. The university trains its students in the areas of engineering and technology, life science and math, social sciences and humanities, providing a high level education on a bachelor, master and PhD level. It's very important for the university <coughs> to give opportunities for scholars to do a field work in high latitudes. The School of Board, the annual Arctic floating university expedition brings Russian and international students and researchers to the Arctic Ocean, Icelands, and archipelagos to do interdisciplinary research to understand the region better. The complexity of tasks in the Arctic require integration and collaboration. NARFO has a rich history of international cooperation in education and research across the borders. The tool of networking is very important, both in national and international context. More than 30 Russian institutions have been united within the National Arctic Research and Educational Consortium, provide advanced research on the Arctic. A very important instrument to develop cooperation between Russian and American higher educational institutions and research centers is the University of the Arctic, the biggest international networking organizations in this field. Your Arctic shared infrastructure educates students of the North and develop uh, interdisciplinary knowledge on the region. By the way, two uh, U-Arctic Vice President Marina Kalinina from NARFU and Mike uh, Castellini from the University of Alaska Fairbanks are taking part in this conference today, as well as one of the conference organizers, Dr. Mike Sraggar, a co-lead co -lead of the U-Arctic Institute of Sokampala Policy. We have a lot of good examples of joint projects between Russian and American universities. The cooperation uh, hasn't been stopped at a time of political tensions, remaining an area of dialogue between professionals in academic area. Such projects as the Model Arctic Council uh, studying the national hazards in the Arctic, studying the floods of northern Russia and Alaska, the maritime preparedness, security, and safety in the high north give great perspectives to our schools on the uh, changing Arctic, produce shared knowledges and understanding. The role of universities is changing today. The universities are getting too more involved in constructing the regional policies and provide good regional practice. The Northern Arctic Federal University used to be an important arena for the Arctic dialogue <coughs> as a permanent venue for the international forum, the Arctic, a territory of dialogue where many of our American colleagues are participated. In the year 2020, our university together, together with the University of Iowa will run the 10th International Congress of Arctic Social Science to attract researchers from all, uh, all uh, over the world to discuss human dimension 
of the Arctic. By the way, Andrei Petrov, elected president of the IASSA, is here with us now. So, of course, we have some proposal for the future cooperation, and um, I'm sure that we have brilliant future together, all together. And uh, thank you for your, for your attention. We are very open for <coughs> the constructive work together. Thank you very Thanks. much. Gotcha. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, let me start by thanking the Wilson Center and the Arctic Circle representatives for arranging this event. I must say that seldom is the timing and the venue for discussions like this as crucial as it is today. These two topics, Arctic and the relations between Russia and the US, have produced thousands of column millimeters in the press and hours and hours of prime time debates, especially to lay the one. And as we all know, so much has happened in both Arctic in general and in the relations between the United States and Russia that the issues deserves a closer attention as a whole. This is important because the Arctic cooperation has been one of the few fields where all the countries have had shared understanding about the benefits for, of working together. I would go even so far to describe this cooperation as a value in itself. This is important because we know that if we want to save the Arctic, we need the Arctic countries to cooperate. But right now, we are in a situation where we seem to be lacking the trust to continue in an open and constructive manner. Many practical solutions we have managed to gain in the field of Arctic cooperation, the SAR agreement and decisions to cut back emissions, would now seem impossible to reach. This is no way to proceed with. Without trust, we lack the way forward. So, what do we do? Or what should we do? I don't have any simple answer to this. What I know is that usually in times of turmoil, we tend to seek solutions and solace from the past. The problem is that it is often just the old ways that brought us into this situation. Climate change is transforming our environment because we needed to produce more and consume more and we paid no attention to the environment. Now this has to change, and it is changing, state by state, individual by individual. And what about the US-Russian relations? The days of Cold War are long gone, and I would say, good riddance. Decades of mistrust and suspicions favored only few and brought instability and insecurity to the rest. And today, the people that would benefit somehow from confrontation are as few. I recognize that there are many issues where Russia and the United States does not look each other eye to eye, but Arctic is one where they should, and we all should. <clears throat> we, or at least many of you, have seen the times of containment, followed by short periods of detente. Walls have been erected and then some holes have been dicked to them. All this with a huge effort. I would like to see the time when such magnificent efforts could be combined to do something constructive and positive for a change. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that these issues we find ourselves involved with, the rearm of great power politics, is not one where you, you would come to seek the advice of a young, first-term parliamentarian from a distant corner of the world. This room is full with so much foreign policy expertise that outshines many UN General Assembly discussions. But the thing is that, as a resident of Arctic, I'm also involved. I'm invited here. And that means that the decisions many of you here might make affect also me. And that means that I have to try to make my own part even it is a small one, trying to come up with constructive solutions. And I do believe that we can share the belief that mistrust and suspicions are not the way forward. So, this is what I know. 
what we all know. Climate in the Arctic is warming twice the speed than elsewhere. This development in the sphere of geo is undermining all our combined efforts to stop the climate reaching any major tipping points. It is also making it harder and harder for us to mitigate the consequences. In other words, challenges are becoming overwhelming. And in the sphere of politics, we are now witnessing how the last few threats of cooperation are being stretched to their limits. While Arctic cooperation has been one of the most functional and pragmatic ones in East-West relations during the last few years, we are in danger to lose the one that has actually worked. Even more, it has helped to maintain the basic connections, the actors. And that is essential in building trust. To sum up the spheres of geo and politics, by continuing the path already travelled, we get nowhere. For a period of time, the age of geopolitics seems to be out of date, and while in fashion, trends tend to return. I would like to think that in the world of politics, there is still hope for true progress. What I'm trying to say, that in the Arctic, we have real problems, ones that will come and kick us in the rear if we fail to act. Problems that can be only overcome if we pool our resources and work together. And in able to succeed this, we all need the United States and the Russian Federation to work together. Arctic can be the start in this. In Arctic, we have this tradition of helping each other in times of need. This has been the only way to survive, let alone succeed. And if Arctic is a laboratory, for climate change, maybe it could be also a laboratory for a cooperation. This is my sincere hope. I, for myself, am also ready to work to this end, not because I would not have anything else pressing in my everyday work at the Finnish Parliament, but because as a resident of the Arctic, I see no alternative. Thank you for the possibility to address you and share some ideas. I look forward to discussions and debate. Thanks. All right, so uh, we are behind schedule, but I think, uh, unless I'm overruled by the organizers, we can take about 10 minutes now for some questions and answers. Um, I want to just put one out on the table, but please uh, raise your hands, and, and I think we can, uh, or go to the microphones, I guess, and, and I think we can take uh, questions from the audience as well, and maybe then give the panel a chance to answer them all together. Um, Katri, I want to take off on your message uh, because, of course, this is a panel which has focused on a record of relative success. I say relative because, uh, as Ambassador Bolton pointed out, it's a, it's a bad time, and yet this is an area where uh, we, we have done some things that defy that trend. You talked about a tradition of relying on one another. Well, I'm, I'm an analyst of the U.S.-Russia relationship. I, I, I try to develop theories to explain both what has happened and then to you know, project what we can do going forward. So I have an analytical question for, for all of you, which is um, why, not why should it work in the Arctic, why does it work in the Arctic? Why don't our conflicts in other areas automatically bleed into the Arctic, and what can we learn from that mechanism, whatever it is that we can apply? Um, let me put that out there and, and think about it, and then let's go, if we can, and take another couple of questions. Gentlemen here. Um, my name is Peter Humphrey. I'm an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. One thing that rarely, uh, if ever, comes up at these conferences is the uh, methane clathrate resource which is a huge, absolutely enormous energy resource waiting for us uh, at the end of this century or perhaps into the next. And I see zero collaboration either on the research side or the engineering side as to how to explore this uh, resource. And I wonder if perhaps the Arctic Council could, could take a more aggressive, uh, a forward-looking uh, uh, approach to methane clathrates to organize research uh, um, and, and to think about not only where the resource is, but how it might be exploited, and most importantly, what environmental standards can we establish right now 
before any of this gets started. Okay, great. And, um, and we'll take the gentleman behind you. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I'm Russell King. I'll, I'll direct this question to um, MP uh, Kalmani. Um, I understand, I, I th thought I heard that Finland manufactures icebreakers, and whether they do or not, I'm sure Finland uses icebreakers. So could you tell me basically what um, shipbuilders are the most competitive internationally for, for icebreakers and anything you know about the production of icebreakers? Okay, so uh, we've got three questions on the table, and what I suggest is we just give everyone on the panel a chance to answer those three questions and offer a final comment if they'd like to do so. so I address the icebreaker. Uh, we have the capability in the United States to build the best icebreakers in the world. We just don't and have not spent the co money from Congress. Uh, we're working on that now. Um, I expect to see money for one. Uh, but in the meantime, Finland is the finest ship uh, builder of icebreakers. Russia will disagree with me. Um, <laughs> but the fact of the matter, both of them build very good icebreakers. And um, we're just behind. Very frankly, the United States is behind. And uh, I, it, it is not a good thing. But the, we have the capability. Swest in uh, uh, shipbuilding in uh, Louisiana builds a great ship. We have uh, Ballinger. We have, I can name all the different shipyards that could build a great icebreaker. It's just... Frankly, we're not in a country that the government does it. We have not provided the money. Well, perhaps I'd address your question most specifically, and I tried to say a word or two about this in my opening remarks. I think the reason why the Arctic is different or the reason why cooperation in the Arctic has continued despite problems elsewhere is because the nations of the Arctic, including Russia and the United States, need each other there, perhaps in ways we don't necessarily need each other elsewhere, uh, to help secure the potential of the Arctic uh, for um, benefit of all the Arctic peoples, to help deal with the, uh, address the problems of the Arctic. Um, we actually do need each other very seriously. and. Uh, we need a stable place in which, in a stable regime in which to, to do that. And that, I think, helps to answer why we have seen cooperation in the Arctic, especially. Can, can I just ask one quick follow-up sure. on that? Is, is the relative um, lack of media attention, and I, I take yes. your point, Katri, that there's plenty of media attention, but the relative lack of media attention actually beneficial in that, or? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'd agree with that. I'd also say that, unfortunately, some of the media attention that the Arctic has attracted recently has missed the point. That's right. They tend to try to focus on the potential for conflict or actual conflict in the Arctic when the story is actually rather different. That's right. Yes. Yeah, I could actually comment briefly on the, on the three points. Well, I try to say that as Arctic cooperation has been so successful, so hopefully it could be also a model and example for other mm -hmm. fields that how in a different sphere of times still the cooperation always works because it's so crucial, not only for the Arctic, but as a whole globe, as we've heard. Then about the f first audience question related to methane and, and environmental research, I guess all the, all the groups are doing very, very important research and uh, academic field of research and what the universities have been talking here. While Finland is now chairing the Arctic Council, one of our top priorities is environmental protection and combat of climate change. So it's very, very high prioritized in Arctic cooperation has, and has been always. And for the third question, well, usually Finn says that... Um, we make 60% of the icebreakers, and we do all the good ones. <laughs> so we have all the, all the line from the planning and research and infrastructure, and here's our CEO of Arctia, Mr. Tero Vauraste, so please continue discussions with him likewise, if politicians are unreli unreliable to, to trust, so. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I would like to say just a few words why the Arctic is a territory of peace and co cooperation, collaboration. If we go to the history of this region, we couldn't find any examples of big conflicts, particularly military conflicts. 
But in the other way, um, last year, for example, all of us uh, jointly celebrated our cooperation during the Second World War. And um, the 75th anniversary of Northern Convoys. This is a wonderful example of our cooperation in a very tough time in the Second World War. And um, <clears throat> this is maybe a joke, but in the warm climate, uh, we can live alone and be alive in this, in this warm climate. But in the Arctic, like in the Antarct Antarctic, it's impossible mm -hmm. to stay alone, uh, to, to, still, to stay alive alone. Mm -hmm. We have to cooperate and we have to be together. Я считаю, что мое сравнение Арктики с космосом очень уместно. Каждая страна э, имела возможность и имеет до сих пор возможность полететь в космос, но, тем не менее, 20 век показал, какие страны способны были туда полететь. И в результате, в любом случае, в 21 веке именно две страны, которые порознь полетели в космос, создали одну станцию и вместе летают и используют эту, эту возможность совместно. Именно эта практика может и должна быть применена к вопросу развития, изучения и экономического процветания арктического региона в целом. Только вместе. В противном случае об освоении Арктики мы будем говорить столетиями. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the likelihood of developing uh, the Arctic for centuries. Well, you know, the, the lesson, it seems, of this tradition, this, I, I very much appreciate the comparison between the Arctic and space and this sense of extreme environment where we cannot survive without each other. Of course, I worry then that the only way, if I were, you know, God looking down on, on this conflicted planet of ours would be to... Uh, subtract about uh, 40 degrees from the average temperature uh, across the equator and, uh, and then suck all of the oxygen out of our atmosphere. If we could just do those two things, then we'll all clearly have to get along. Um, but short of that, maybe we can find some other solutions. Thank you all so much for joining us on this panel. Um, and thanks again. Thank you, sir. As the, thank you very much, and as the panels now transition, uh, I want to thank the panelists for their very insightful and, in fact, encouraging comments. And, and again, as the panels transition, let me just say a couple of things. One is that when President Grimson and myself and Alice Rogoff talked about uh, the idea for this meeting, we hoped that discussions like this would occur, that it would be a window in which we could take a look for just a few hours at the things that we actually are working together uh, on throughout the Arctic regions, and especially uh, highlighting the U.S.-Russia relationship. So I'm, I'm in heartened, by, heartened by the discussions that you've heard this morning. And as, we've pa as we transition to the next panel, let me just say that after this panel, uh, we'll have a break for lunch and then a hard start at 2 p.m., and those themes will be on research and security, issues related to the Coast Guard, the Bering Strait, and several other issues that will be teased out during the panel discussions. So now let me please introduce the panelists for this next panel, a view from the outside of the Arctic, that was specifically added to provide a little bit more discussion on the issues related to the Arctic, but with a different view. So if you would just please, please take your seats, and we'll begin the final panel before the lunch. So to my left, I'm pleased to introduce Sherry Goodman, a senior fellow here at the Wilson Center, former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense at the U.S. State Department. Defense. To her left is Ambassador Young Jun Kim, Ambassador for Arctic Affairs from the Republic of Korea. 
To his left is Eric Sievertson, a member of parliament from Norway and chair of the Standing Committee of Parliamentarians of the Arctic Region. And to his left is Cheryl Shum, Deputy Chief of Mission and Counselor from the Embassy of Singapore here in Washington, D.C. Thank you all. And Sherry, I will turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and it's a thank you uh, to you and uh, President Grimson, Alice Rogoff, uh, Ambassador Calpe. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And thank you to each of you in this room who has helped make this event possible. Uh, we're, we're very pleased to have uh, everyone here. Uh, and reflecting on the last panel uh, about the history of cooperation in the Arctic, um, I just have to share a short story of my own because at the end of the Cold War, uh, when I was serving in the Defense Department, U.S. Defense Department, I found myself leading a program called Arctic Military Environmental Cooperation uh, among the U.S., Norway, and Russia uh, at a time where all three of our countries and others um, who joined later Finland and the U.K. and a number of others were working to apply, uh, our apply our knowledge, our scientific cooperation uh, among not only militaries, but environmental and energy organizations in our countries to address challenges left by post-Cold War contamination in the Arctic region. And so um, it's, it's a pleasure to see that, that that collaboration and that spirit of cooperation can continue uh, to today. So we say what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Uh, as the last panel noted, climate change, of course, is the canary in the coal mine, or as a senator from Alaska has been known to say, the elephant in the igloo. So since our panel is the only uh, thing standing between you all and lunch, we're going to get right to it. And we're, uh, there's no better group to address this challenge uh, than leading diplomats and parliamentarians from Korea, Singapore, and Norway. And since our Norwegian friend, I understand, has a uh, pressing engagement just following this, we're going to give um, uh, Mr. Sivertsen the chance to start us off. Thank you for that, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in these discussions. I think it's um, very important also that you have choose the headline, Russia and uh, the United States in, in the Arctic. As uh, chairman of the Arctic parliamentarians, representing all the Arctic countries and the European Parliament, I see it as important to be as inclusive as possible when talking about the Arctic. So I will buy, base my views on the statement from the Conference of the Parliamentarians of the Arctic Regions from Ulan Ude in Russia last year. But I have to say, it's somewhat odd for me to speak in the session which is named A View from Outside the Arctic. Uh, myself be living in the city of Bode, uh, north of the Polar Circle, representing in this con uh, context all the people of the Arctic. Uh, but I will use the opportunity to make a few points and comment upon a few points of perspectives or per the perception uh, I meet when I'm talking with people not living in the Arctic. So let me first comment upon the idea that the Arctic is a lawless wilderness, or a last frontier. No, it isn't. As, as you, as friends of the Arctic, of course, know this, but uh, this is a peaceful and a well-governed uh, area by the Arctic uh, countries uh, through international law. The UN Convention of Law of the Sea is the primary international agreement for governing the Arctic Ocean. The eight sovereign Arctic states have their obligations, and the rights in accordance with international law. There's no need for an Arctic treaty, but there could be potential for uh, develop uh, existing uh, instruments. For an example, when we are discussing fisheries in the region. The second perception or perspective I often meet is about the knowledge of what is in the Arctic, what exists in the Arctic. When you travel around the world or uh, along the polar circle, meeting in conferences and seminars like this. Uh, there's a lot of us doing th uh, this in this uh, room, I see. We often see a lot of pictures of wonderful nature, animals, and icebergs. 
but you rarely see pictures of humans, buildings, or human activities. The point is, the Arctic is an inhabited area. There are about 4 million people living in the Arctic. Economic development and opportunities for the people living in the Arctic are vital in creating resilient and prosperous Arctic societies and better lives for the people living there. For, who, for us who are uh, the elected representatives of the people, the Arctic is first and foremost about the lives and the opportunities of the inhabitants in the Arctic. For us, it's of paramount importance to develop the societies and the uh, possibilities for the people there. The third is the perception about the Arctic, the one Arctic. I will argue that there is no such thing as one Arctic. It's huge differences between the American Arctic, the Russian Arctic and the Nordic Arctic. One size will not fit all when we are discussing solution and future development of the Arctic. Norway has its ice-free harbors all year round and a well-developed infrastructure. For several years, it has been offshore operations in the Barents Sea, north of 71 degrees north. That is very different from the situation in the northern parts of Alaska. There are also big differences inside the countries. For an example, between the ways of life of Norwegians and the traditional ways of the Sami people in Norway, Sweden, Finland and Russia. The fourth is about the importance of protecting the Arctic. I am personally very eager to protect the Arctic. We see and feel the effects of the climate change taking place in the Arctic already today, in Alaska, in Greenland, and in Norway. Ice and permafrosts are melting and winds have already increased. Imagine if we currently face a global climate warming of three degrees elsewhere, the effect in the Arctic can be six to eight degrees Celsius. This is why emissions reductions promised in the Paris, in the Paris Agreement is essential. Because it's not the four million people living in the Arctic alone that have created the climate changes. We'll take our part of the responsibility, but we do not solve the global, uh, global climate crisis by making the Arctic into a sanctuary. We will have to continue to address climate change, mitigation, as well as adaptation, and to continue to build resilience in the Arctic. But to control the uh, global warming, we need a joint global effort. That will be the effective way to protect the Arctic, not by making the Arctic into a sanctuary. The fifth is about the non-existent race for resources. All the Arctic nations and the Arctic uh, Council has the goal to keep the Arctic as a peaceful and a stable region. And as the, the panel uh, here uh, earlier discussed, we are doing a good job in uh, that. And therefore, the Arctic Corporation should develop and strengthen it, uh, its economic agenda in cooperation with the business sector. There is a global attention on how the resources in the Arctic might be developed in a sustainable manner. Science, research, and cooperation will be important in making this happen. Non-renewable natural resources uh, development must be utilized to help build societies that last beyond the life of the resource. I believe it's time to also address Arctic innovation beyond the development of natural resources. What will the people living in the Arctic live of in, ad in addition to its rich natural resources? How do we stimulate innovation in the Arctic which addresses the needs of future Arctic societies? What can we learn from the sustainable lifestyles of the Arctic indigenous people? The Arctic Economic Council has been established uh, and has set up a secretariat in Tromsø, Norway. From the Arctic parliamentarians' side, we have established good contacts with the representatives of the Council and its uh, former chair, Ms. Tara Sweeney. And we have co-hosted the Arctic De Economic Development Forum in Washington, D.C. in the beginning of April last year. And I uh, am looking forward to develop this cooperation with the new chair, Mr. Uh, Taro Varjosto. And I have to say in this uh, context that I'm very glad that in last week when we met in Aulu, I heard that uh, the Arctic Economic Council has endorsed the idea about the Arctic Investment Protocol. 
When we are de developing closer ties between the governments and the business sector, we should look to what already is in place. I believe that governments and businesses operating in the Arctic should use the international uh, corporate social uh, responsibility guidelines and find ways to implement them in the Arctic. Such instruments could be the UN Global Compact Initiative, or as the Arctic Economic Council is arguing, the Arctic Investment Protocol, presented by the World Economic Forum in January last year. I agree that we will have to invest in infrastructure to develop the, uh, the Arctic. And today, I have heard argues, uh, people arguing to invest in ports. I agree in that and think it's important to uh, invest in ports also for the future. From the Norwegian side, I would like to mention that this week in the parliament, we had a big debate about uh, the national transport plan for the 12 years to come. And there we decided to invest about 400 million uh, Norwegian crowns in developing the harbor uh, in Longyearbyen at Svalbard. That will be an important hub. Uh, uh, a logistic hub for uh, maritime activities in, uh, in the Arctic uh, uh, Ocean. I also will argue very strongly that we need to develop broadband telecommunications in the Arctic. Today, it's very hard to have communication at all, north of 73 degrees north. But if the future is digital, and it will be, then it also has to be a digital Arctic. So uh, the short version here is get those satellites up and running mm -hmm. as fast as possible. The time for assessments is past. And uh, again, I will challenge the Arctic Economic Council to work with us parliamentarians uh, uh, in that. I will uh, end this by, uh, by mentioning something the Finnish ambassador was uh, uh, talking about. Because I agree that developing the Arctic is a political uh, question. And the Arctic Council has played an important role in the past 20 years. And I think the time has come for looking into what should the Arctic Council be in the future. How should we continue to develop the Arctic uh, Council? Therefore, the parliamentarians of the Arctic regions has been arguing and will support the Finnish uh, chairmanship in uh, arranging or uh, getting uh, a summit for heads of state into discussing how should we develop uh, the Arctic cooperation on the basis of the Arctic Council for the decades to, to come. I hope you all here will support us in getting this in place and in this hard and difficult political climate we have globally. I think it's especially important to lift it to that uh, level. I'm looking forward uh, to uh, seeing the Finnish chairmanship succeeds in getting such a summit. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. As a uh, Norwegian, certainly you have the view from inside the Arctic, but as an Arctic parliamentarian, you've well shared with us the view from outside. Next, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Ambassador Kim uh, of Korea, and I believe you have a presentation for us. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, the, I, I should convey the, my thanks to uh, Wilson Center and uh, former uh, president, Iceland president, Mr. Grimson, for inviting this important forum, and it is great uh, it is a great honor for me to be here to explain Korea's uh, Arctic policy and uh, activities. Korea's Arctic activities dated back in 1990s. The Dasan Arctic Science uh, Station was established uh, in Shibalbar in 2022, uh, 2002, and Korea built its first icebreak uh, research vessel, Arahon, in 2009. And Korea joined the Arctic Council as a permanent observer in 2013, along with Japan, China, and Singapore, and so on. Uh, in the same year, Korea joined the Arctic Circle. Uh, we uh, established our official policy on Arctic by adopting the first 
uh, Arctic uh, Polish master plan with the vision of uh, contributing to a sustainable future of Arctic. To implement the master plan, the detailed action plan was made every year, and we are now preparing the second master plan for the next five years. In addition, we are planning to build a second ice-breaking research vessel by 2022. And Korea has been actively uh, uh, participating. Korea has been actively participating in uh, and making a contribution in activities in Arctic, Arctic Council, including its working groups and the task force. Korea holds bilateral uh, consultations with most of Arctic countries. This year, we will hold uh, bilateral consultations with Norway, Denmark, Russia, and Finland. Korea also participates in the international forums on the Arctic, including the Arctic Circle, uh, Arctic Frontier, and so on. In addition, Korea Maritime Institute, KMI, organizes Korea Arctic Academy every year. Since 2015, Korea has invited around 40 uh, Arctic indigenous st students to Korea for this exchange program between Arctic and Korea students. And as for the Arctic research activities, Korea Polar Research Institute, COPRI, is the leading agency for the National Polar Research Program. COPRI is actively engaged in the scientific cooperation with the Arctic states and also uh, in international scientific collaborations through such as International Arctic uh, Science Committee and uh, Pacific uh, Arctic Group. Korea has been engaged in Arctic business, mainly in the fields of shipping and shipbuilding. Korea also has been participating in the negotiations on the high seas fisheries uh, in the Central Arctic Ocean. Now, Korea, uh, uh, so Arctic cooperation with United States is mainly focused on the scientific research. COPRI has been collaborating with uh, such as NOAA and University of Alaska Fairbank and the US Geological Survey and so on. Korea co-hosts the North Pacific Arctic Conference with East-West Center in Hawaii annually since 2011. And Korea's Arctic cooperation with Russia also focuses mainly on the scientific research. But it is true uh, that uh, both sides are looking at some possibilities to explore business opportunities, especially in the areas of shipping, ship area, uh, shipping, shipbuilding, and the national, natural resources. As for the scientific research, COPRI has been cooperating with the Shirishoff Institute of Oceanology and the Russian Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute. Uh, as for uh, business corporations, Korea Shipbuilding Company is building a total of 15 ice-breaking LNG carriers for Yamal project and delivered the first fleet uh, in March of this year. Yeah, from the Korea's experience in the Arctic for the purpose of uh, addressing the challenges we are facing in globally, I'd like to make four suggestions on Arctic activities. First, uh, Arctic should remain as a zone of peace. Uh, recently, military presence has been active in that area, and also tensions between Russia and the West over the Ukraine is one of the factors to impede international cooperation in the Arctic. In order to maintain the peace and stability in the Arctic, a strict rule-based international order should be applied in the region. Second, uh, non-Arctic states should play uh, constructive roles more actively and make meaningful contrib contributions to address Arctic issues. In this regard, uh, Korea as an, an observer state uh, in the Arctic Council shares the sense of responsibility with the Arctic states and has the willingness to increase it, our uh, contribution to deal with challenges we are facing in the Arctic. Third, 
Observers have a, a limited right to participate in the activities of Arctic Council. This reality uh, sometimes makes the observers uh, feel frustrated. The area uh, where global addresses are necessary have been increased. In this regard, Korea appreciates the U.S. Initiative, initiative to engage observers under its Arctic Council chairmanship, and we hope that such engagement will continue and uh, be extended in the future. Lastly, uh, to a certain extent, a current governance system in the Arctic is a kind of a closed one. Uh, considering changing situation surrounding the Arctic for the last 20 years and the urgent need to address global challenges in the region, the governance system of Arctic should become more open step by step based on the issue areas in the long-term perspectives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. That was extremely well stated. Uh, now we turn to another important uh, partner and ally outside the Arctic. Uh, we're pleased to have the Deputy Chief of Mission from Singapore, uh, Ms. Cheryl Shum. Excellencies, fellow panelists, um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to everybody. Um, just wanted to first thank the Arctic Council and the Wilson Center for arranging this event on cooperation in the Arctic on a warm summer day in DC. Um, and um, thank you, of course, for inviting me to share Singapore's perspectives on the Arctic. Um, today I'll just speak briefly about why we're interested in Arctic affairs and how we contribute um, to the Arctic Council. So Singapore applied for observer status at the Arctic Council in December 2011, and we were granted observer status in May 2013. And I understand it's not immediately obvious why Singapore, a small tropical country, um, located just one degree north of the equator and over 7,000 kilometers away from the Arctic Circle would be interested in developments in the Arctic or would even want to be an observer to the Arctic Council. But the truth is, despite our distance, Singapore is really quite connected to the Arctic because of climate change, global warming, and changing weather patterns. As a small, low-lying coastal nation, we want to better understand climate change and the impact of melting Arctic ice caps on Singapore. Much of Singapore lies only 15 meters above mean sea level, and about 30% of our country lies actually below five meters above sea level. So this makes us especially vulnerable to rising sea levels. If global temperatures rise, many parts of Singapore could eventually be submerged. We also want to better understand the implications and opportunities arising from a warmer Arctic. The opening of transarctic shipping lanes, especially the Northern Sea Route, can provide shorter alternatives to conventional routes between Europe and Asia that go through the Suez Canal and the Straits of Malacca. This development offers both uncertainties as well as opportunities for Singapore. Seaborne trade, of course, is Singapore's lifeblood. We are located on the Straits of Malacca, and our trade to GDP ratio is one of the highest in the world. Given our dependence on maritime trade, the opening of Arctic sea routes would naturally pique our interest. Singapore is also a maritime hub and one of the world's busiest ports, receiving about 120,000 vessels per year. Our marine industry has built up strong capabilities and credentials in shipbuilding and repair and offshore engineering. Hence, apart from a, des from a desire to study the impact of shifting sh shipping patterns on our status as a transshipment hub, we're also interested in exploring opportunities for our marine industries in the Arctic. Since the early 1990s, Singapore companies have possessed competencies in constructing ice-class vessels. In addition to being the first Asian shipyard to build icebreakers, Singapore's Keppel Group, the world's largest builder of offshore oil rigs, has also developed and refurbished rigs to operate in Arctic conditions. Since Singapore became an observer to the Arctic Council, we have been an active contributor to the sustainable development of the region. Where possible, we aim to work constructively with our friends in the Arctic in areas where we have experience and know-how and can add value. For instance, the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore has been an active participant in a number of working groups and task force, um, namely the protection of Arctic marine environment, emergency pre prevention, preparedness, and response, and also the ta task force on Arctic marine oil pollution prevention 
and Arctic Marine Cooperation. In these committees, we share Singapore's approach of interagency coordination and regional cooperation on dealing and managing oil spills. Singapore also recognizes that the Arctic indigenous people who have lived in the North for generations are crucial stakeholders in the region. Um, hence, we've established the Singapore Arctic Council Permanent Participants Cooperation Package, which is a technical assistance program customized in consultation with Arctic Council's Indigenous People Secretariat to cater to the specific and current development needs of permanent participants. Under this package, we provide funding for representatives of the permanent participants to attend short-term courses in Singapore on various aspects of public administration. We also provide um, full scholarships for students from indigenous communities to pursue postgraduate studies in maritime law, public policy and administration, and maritime studies in Singapore. In addition, we've also hosted several study visits to Singapore for representatives of permanent participants. The next study visit will take place in early July and will focus on conservation and management of heritage sites, port management, tourism promotion, public administration, and multicultural policies. Finally, in line with the Arctic Council's objective of disseminating information, encouraging education and promoting interest in Arctic-related issues, Singapore has also sought to raise public awareness of the Arctic's importance both in Singapore and in our region through events, seminars, and workshops. Singapore hosted the Arctic Circle Singapore Forum in November 2015, which was the first of its kind in Asia. Um, President Grimson um, delivered a keynote address in this forum. We're very honored to have that. In August 2016, um, the National University of Singapore's Energy Studies Institute held a seminar called Energy Transitions in a Globalized Arctic with the support of the US Office of Naval Research. This seminar examined issues such as access to energy in remote locations and the governance of sustainable energy transitions. In January this year, with the support of the Royal Norwegian Embassy, we hosted the first Arctic Council event in Southeast Asia. This was the Arctic Migratory Bird Initiative Workshop. And we did this with CAF, the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna Working Group. This event was held at Singapore Sungai Bulo Wet Wetland Reserve, which is home to more than 2,000 Arctic migratory birds from over 30 different species, including the Wimbrel and the Curlew Sandpiper, that they stop over um, in Singapore during the winter. The workshop brought together 96 experts from 25 countries to advance the work to improve the status and secure the long-term sustainability of declining migratory bird populations. Our research institutes in Singapore and our universities have also dedicated resources to research on Arctic-related issues. I hope that I've helped to explain a little bit about why Singapore regards the Arctic as a region of global importance and why we seek to contribute actively to its sustainable development. Moving forward, I hope we can continue to contribute to the work of the Arctic Council and the permanent participants, as well as in efforts in raising awareness of Arctic issues in Southeast Asia. Thank you. Well, that was a, an excellent uh, presentation and shows you the range of activities that our Asian uh, allies and partners are engaged with and how important their cooperation is uh, to the Arctic future. I see we have about five minutes, uh, so I'm gonna start out with um, a couple of, of questions and then we'll be happy to take any uh, if, there are some, if there are some before we break uh, for lunch. So I know just recently China, Japan, and Korea held their second trilateral Arctic dialogue. Um, and I wonder if um, both each of you could discuss uh, China's ev evolving role in the Arctic. I know that the, the Northern Sea Route was not initially included as part of what's known as the One Belt, One Road project. Um, but Beijing now appears to be developing it alongside uh, its other strands, and this could lead to as much as 15% of Chinese trade sailing through the Northern Sea Route by 2020, um, which could bring um, uh, even additional closer cooperation between China and Russia in this region. And I wondered if you could both uh, comment on how that uh, affects your views about evolving Arctic cooperation with, the, uh, with China. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, we, between Korea and China, we have uh, more, a lot of the trade and a lot of more big relations uh, politically and um, there, there is uh, some areas also we have, uh, some areas we have cooperation, some areas we have conflict, uh, it's true. And uh, also if we add uh, in Japan, in that case, the more, more complicated situation we could face. Anyway, uh, Arctic is one of area the, between China and Korea to make a cooperate. Uh, Actually, the, we thought uh, it's the new areas, new frontiers of cooperation, or new uh, areas of diplomacy. The, as you mentioned, the, among three countries, Korea, China, Japan, we started the, uh, our uh, trilateral uh, Arctic dialogue. Its initiation was made by, our, by Korean side at the summit of 2015. Last year, the first meeting was held in Seoul, and the second meeting was uh, uh, held early this month in Japan. And next year, it is supposed to be hold, uh, held in China. I think uh, at this moment, uh, we think, uh, uh, we three countries think uh, uh, Arctic is uh, the area to cooperate uh, among, other, among three countries. And also, we are now succeeded to regularize to, um, uh, to hold the meetings. And the other one is, uh, there, there is also, we have some uh, the homework. We should uh, extend our area's cooperation. It's one of, the, currently, the cooperation area is uh, uh, limited in scientific, science and scientific research, but uh, we should extend our cooperation in the education, communications, and uh, engagement to other the activities, so on and so on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, Singapore and China are, of course, very close, um, close relations, and China is a important trading partner of Singapore. It's our number one trading partner. Um, and we have uh, cooperated with China on a huge range of issues, on economic security. Um, and um, we are big supporters of the One Belt, One Road um, initiative as well. Um, <laughs> Not aware of any specific cooperation with China on the Arctic issues when we don't have a trilateral um, conference um, like Korea does, but um, I certainly see the opportunity for cooperation with China um, moving forward on this, these issues, both in the economic sphere, in research and scientific research, in um, even uh, technical cooperation. We can work with them on um, sustainable development issues and climate change issues. So I think um, really the sky's the limit there. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think I will uh, ask the, uh, if I see no one coming to the mic, I will ask the last question, then we will uh, head to lunch. Both of you spoke very eloquently uh, about the need to address climate change globally and particularly uh, in the Arctic and the research um, that is going on there. Uh, how, do you, how do you see the, both the Arctic Council and related institutions evolving to enable us not only to conduct the science, which we'll get into in depth in the uh, panels in the afternoon, uh, but the additional actions that are going to be needed to address the changing climate, sea level rise, ocean acidification, and other challenges uh, that we face uh, in this region. Okay, I'll take a stab at this. <laughs> Um, well, I think the Arctic Council, from what I know of it, has proven to be a good model of cooperation on many issues despite the possibly difficult um, political circumstances. And I think in difficult issues or in issues like climate change where I think a global, re a global response is necessary, um, I think it can serve as a model for cooperation. And it, it is in, indeed uh, in a way a tip, at the tip of the spear because of uh, where it's located. Um, Singapore certainly is, remains very committed to the climate change agreement. Um, we are a low-lying coastal nation and, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why we got involved in the Arctic Council. And, um, you know, we have been very encouraged by how the international community has responded and I think we look forward to continuing to contribute to these global efforts. Well, let me, uh, I'm going to thank our panelists. I think we've shown that uh, we can continue the history of, of, of significant cooperation in the Arctic uh, that has run now through both the nuclear age and into the climate era. 
And if that's one of the evolving themes uh, of this conference, and I think we will have all done uh, a service, uh, not only in the Arctic, uh, but globally. And let me also, just as we close out, I would like to everyone to thank the, the extraordinary Wilson team that's been working behind the scenes to make this day successful uh, for all of you. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you to the panelists for the insight. I think that it's very clear before we take a break for lunch that uh, what you often hear in the press is that the Arctic is an, is an emerging territory, an emerging issue, an emerging, well, I don't think it's emerging anything more. I think we've put a fine point on the fact that the Arctic is part of a global dialogue and there are more than other, the other eight Arctic nations that are interested in Arctic issues. And that was hopefully what we were trying to get at, at least part of this morning and the afternoon, the filter through which we have seen the Arctic through the US, Russia, through the eight Arctic nations, and now perspectives from outside of the Arctic. So we're gonna take a break, but I wanna remind you that at 2 p.m., Ambassador Mark Brzezinski will join us for the third keynote later in the afternoon. Admiral uh, Zukov will join us for a fourth interview. He actually will give us short a keynote, and then he will be interviewed by David Martin, the national security reporter for CBS News. And this afternoon will be about research, security, Coast Guard, and in a very important region to many of us, the Bering Strait. So let's take a break, and we will start again at 2 p.m. Thank you.